This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Story Beat episodes are available at storybeat.net and on all major podcast apps and platforms. If you like this episode, please take a moment to leave us a rating or review. And please, won't you subscribe to Story Beat wherever you listen to podcasts? My guest today, Jamie DeRoy, is a show business tour de force. Not only is Jamie a prolific Tony Award-winning producer on Broadway and beyond, she's also a cabaret, stage, film, and TV performer, a recording artist and producer, and humanitarian. Jamie started out as a singer, opening for many comics, including Norm Crosby, Robert Klein, and Joan Rivers. She morphed into a musical comedy performer and the talk show host of Cabaret Beat, and then Jamie DeRoy and Friends, which has been on the air for 30 years. She's produced 10 CDs, appeared on TV and in many films, most notably Goodfellas, Raging Bull, See No Evil, Hear No Evil, Alice, Spider-Man, and Knight Rider. In 1995, she produced her first off-Broadway show and has been co-producing on and off-Broadway ever since. Jamie's 55 plus Broadway productions have been nominated for more than 30 Tony Awards, of which she's won seven for The Ferryman, Angels in America, The Band's Visit, Once on This Island, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, and The Norman Conquests. Jamie's also won numerous Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle, Broadway World Audience Choice, Drama League, Mac, Backstage Bistro, and Telly Awards. As of this recording, Jamie is currently nominated for four Tony Awards for this abbreviated 2019-2020 Broadway season. For Best Musical for Tina, the Tina Turner Musical, for Best Play Revival for Frankie and Johnny, and for Best Play for both The Inheritance and Slave Play. A few of Jamie's other Broadway credits include Network, that starred one of my favorite story beat guests, Brian Cranston, Company, To Kill a Mockingbird, Three Tall Women, Latin History for Morons, The Play That Goes Wrong, Bright Star, American Psycho, China Doll with Al Pacino, Fiddler on the Roof, The Addams Family, Ragtime, Blythe Spirit with Angela Lansbury, Thurgood, and many more. Jamie's more than 40 off-Broadway productions include The Confession of Lily Dare, Pride and Prejudice, Othello the Remix, Not That Jewish, and The Lion. Among Jamie's stage appearances are The Three Penny Opera with René Aubergenois and The Drunkard with a musical director named Barry Manilow. So for all those exceptional reasons and many, many more, I'm deeply honored to welcome a fellow Alderdice High School alum the native Pittsburgh powerhouse, better known as Jamie DeRoy, to story beat today. Jamie, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. And everybody, of course, from Pittsburgh knew me as Jamie Gruber. <laughs> Jamie Gruber. Well, but you're now known as Jamie DeRoy, and that's for sure. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, when did all of this passion for theater begin? When you were a small child? Was it, could it come oh, from yeah. your mom? Where did it come from? I don't think it came from my mother, but I don't know where it came from. I just remember when I was quite young, I'd be in, you know, every little school, wherever I was in school, you know, and dancing school. I remember my aunt giving me a little pink penwa set, which, you know, was a little nightgown, a little pink nightgown with a little pink, like, robe that went over it. And my mo- and it had ruffles on the top, and my mother took it and put all of these rhinestones and sequins and little appliques and stuff, and she decorated it because I had gotten a role in The Princess and the Pea. I can't even remember where it was, but it must have been like a dancing school, something like a little recital. And so she, you know, dressed up my my little penwa set. 
and and I loved it, of course. I was pretty little. Um, and it just it just snowballed for, from there. I mean, anything that I could get into in Pittsburgh that had anything to do with performing or dancing or whatever I did. Well, curiously enough, the high school musical in Alderdice that I did was Once Upon a Mattress. Uh, oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when my brother was, I, I'm trying, it, it must have been graduating from the Linden grade school. Grade school, sure that he played uh, the Mad Hatter in the Alice in Wonderland show they were doing. And so I got cast as one of the little dancers and, um, and you know, I got to dress up and I mean, it was always fun. I mean, maybe it was the dress up that sort of encouraged me. I'm not a hundred percent sure. But, but you, you were attracted to the glamor of it and the lights and the glitz and all that. That was oh, all totally. very interesting. And then somehow, well, I kind of know how. There was in a friend of my parents by the name of Jimmy Winokur, and he was contacting all his friends, I guess, in a r roughly, the year was roughly 1954, a little bit before, because I think it opened in 1954, and he raised money for Harold Prince for the pajama game. Really? And so my father and most of his friends put in about a thousand dollars into the pajama game and later on it was probably when i in maybe 55 or so he took me to new york my both my parents took me to new york at, to see pajama game harold prince arranged that we could go backstage so i met janice page and john raid and eddie foy jr and it was just like oh my god so as i was already smitten with the theater but that was really the theater. That was Broadway. That was it. That was, and the, I that knew, was the, true, the true limelight. That was the big deal. Oh, my God. I mean, that was the, the creme de la creme. I mean, you know, what we had was community theater. And I was already, you know, wanting to do this. Mm -hmm. But then when you see the real thing and you see Broadway singers and dancers, and in those days, the core, there was like a, dance chorus and a singing chorus. Now you have to do both, but in those days, they were almost separated. But um, but anyway, j but just to go backstage, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's enough to be in front of, you know, seeing them on stage, but then to go backstage and see it from the other side and meet the real stars. I mean, there was no going back at that time. My parents uh, knew that that, that was, <laughs> <laughs> there was no change in my mind after that. Well, I, I can, the same for me. As soon as that, whatever this thing is, this theater bug got into my blood system, that was it. It's never gone away. It's always been in there. It's, it's amazing. It's something it's, you can't put your finger on. You can't, it's very hard to explain it. And it's even harder to explain now that we are missing all this theater, this live theater that nobody can experience because right. experiencing it on zoom doesn't begin to describe the feeling that you have if you're sitting in a theater among other people not watching at all. a show not at all it's the totally different experience on a screen than it is live with humans and the smells of the crowd and everything else there's just right. no substitute for it uh and i think once it is in your system you and you can't get it out of your system it's what you must do and right. i think most everybody that i know who's been involved in the theater for their career and their lives that's the same for them as well they they can't wash it out and even if somebody later on changes a career path it never leaves them correct i i, I truly believe that you know maybe they saw hey i really have to make a living that i have can depend on and you know the the biggest problem with being an actor is that you have to depend on a lot of other people wanting you for that role. And, you know, the director could want you, but then somebody else mixes you or, you know, whatever. I mean, it takes so many people to make that final decision. And when I came to New York and I, I started, I mean, I, my first <laughs> my first show was The Drunker, my first actual show. But I went to that audition because it was on my way to a dinner date. <laughs> I hate to admit that. 
but I read backstage and showbiz and all that. And I saw about this audition for the drunkard at the 13th street theater. And I was like, Oh, well, I have to go to the village anyway to meet my friend for dinner. I might as well go a little early and stop an audition for this, never thinking that I could actually end up with a job. You're, and that's you're, what say, you're, saying, you're saying it was an audition of convenience? Totally. <laughs> I mean, I have a feeling that if that audition had been uptown, I might not have, <laughs> I might not have gone. I could be very lazy in those days. So yeah, so it was on my way. It was 13th Street is at the kind of like the top of the village and I had to go to Greenwich Village. It was really literally on the way. I, and I stopped in there. So no one was more surprised than myself when I got the job. <laughs> and that is how I met Barry Manilow way back then. Cause he was our musical director. He played the show off Broadway and he did all the incidental music for all, you know, for the, for the show off Broadway and on the road. And, um, and then when I came back from the road and I went back to the off Broadway uh, production, which was only at that point, I think playing on weekends. So it was, it was great for me because uh, it freed me up for the rest of the time, but I still got to be performing. But, you know, I had a relationship with Barry and I, when I started working with him as a, as my musical director, you know, just working on stuff. We didn't even know what we were working on specifically. We we're just working on songs and just stuff. One day I walked into a rehearsal. He was living in the village at the time. And uh, more, I think maybe east, a little bit east. Not was definitely not West Village. Anyway, I walk into a rehearsal and he's sitting there with Adrian Arts, who became later Adrian Arts Anderson. Mm -hmm. But Adrian Arts, I knew from college from from Carnegie Tech which is right. you know now CMU right and I was like I didn't know they knew each other and I was like oh my god this is so cool you know each other she said can we ask you a favor and I'm like sure what and she said do you mind if you start a little bit late we would love to play you a song we just wrote and I said okay and they played me could it be magic Oh. I mean, I just sat there with my mouth open, like, oh my God, this is so fantastic. Wow. And it, it was just, and you know, Barry playing the piano and them singing, it was, I, I melted. It was, it was, it was just incredible. If I had been in those days, if I was looking to be a manager, I would have signed him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have done very well had you done so. <laughs> I definitely would have done very well. Better than I'm doing on my own. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious. I want to stick with Pittsburgh for half a second before we move on to New York. And that is this. Um, your mom is a very highly regarded and very well-known artist, sculptor, painter, photographer, um, Aronel DeRoy Gruber. And I'm just curious, growing up in a house that was filled with art and an artist, did living with her influence who you became? Did she give you any kind of pointers as to how to be in the arts? Well, no, and I don't think she particularly knew how to be in the, the, the end of the arts that I wanted to be in. But what happened was that when she was, you know, young and, and you know, her early days and probably early days of marriage too, she, you know, took a job, I think at one point of being a window dresser. Um, and I think her mother talked her out of art school at in those early days. She went to Margaret Morrison at CMU. Right. Um, so I guess I was, I don't know, I, my younger brother was quite young. I think I was still in Lin, at Linden and she went back to art school. So her mothering was, you know, for me, it didn't matter because I was like, you know, getting a little older, but my brother was pretty young. But I kind of loved to watch her success. I mean, she did, she went, the teacher was Sam Rosenberg. And the first painting that she did was bought by a restaurant called the, um, not the Edge, we went there, the Edge was something else. But they bought this painting and it was like the one of her earliest paintings. And she started winning awards right off the bat and everything. So it was just an, a very interesting time to watch her success. 
And I remember being taken out of school. I was at Linden just for the afternoon, but just to be driven to her art studio because there was a photo shoot for the Pittsburgh, one of the Pittsburgh papers doing an article on her. And it was my younger brother and myself. I don't know where my older brother was because he was probably in high school and, and he went to Alderdice too. But maybe he just couldn't get out or maybe he, he was a big tennis player. Maybe he had a game. I, I can't remember why <laughs> he wasn't taken with us to her studio because it was just me and, and Terry. But I, I just relished in her success always. But, you know, she learned, I guess, early on, even though that she was told, you know, you can't go to art school, that she kept pursuing her, her dream even through her marriage. And um, even though she never really maybe came out and said, don't ever listen to people if they say no, I, I learned it from her by just picking it up because she'd been told no and she still did it. And, you know? how, and, and I would imagine that has held you in great stead throughout a career in show business, which is filled with the word no. Totally. So, so you, you have to be able to see past the negatives in order to get anything accomplished because rarely is it just a green light all the way. It, well, exactly. And the, the, the thing is, is that um, we're in so many instances, instances told, you know, you, you can't do that. I had a friend that was a, a headhunter for, at the time, Ashley Famous Agency. No, he wasn't, I'm sorry, he wasn't, a headhunter for them. He was a headhunter for the person who owned it. Okay. And he also owned, uh, why do I think the name was Steve Ross, but it wasn't Steve Ross, the, the, the Steve Ross that I know today, but, but they, he owned um, like a limousine company. My, so my friend was the headhunter and he said to me, I could probably get you an audition for Ashley Famous. And so I was sent to Ashley Famous, I believe by a man by the name of, it was Steve Ross who later died. Um, Used to be at but, Warner Brothers. That's Steve Ross? Is that the one? Yeah, they, they owned funeral parlors and limousines. So then he figured out that the limousines weren't busy at night because the funerals weren't at night. <laughs> so then he st took all those limousines and he put them to work at night. I mean, he was a genius. He really I think was. That, I think that is Steve Ross from same, Warner Brothers. I think that's the so, same guy. So he, you know, he bought this Ashley Famous. It became ICM, International Creative Management. Mm -hmm. And um, I got an audition for them, but I wanted to audition for Broadway, but they wouldn't see me for, for theater, only for nightclubs. So I was pretty naive. I was like, well, I just want to audition as a singer. So what do I care where I sing? It did lead me in a direction I wasn't maybe totally meant to be in, but it was still fun. I still would have preferred to have gone the Broadway route. Right. I, wish, I wish they would have seen me for Broadway, but they said, oh, there's no room in the Broadway roster, but but there's room in nightclubs. So I, so I audition, I'm taken into this office and I'm, they, he, this guy opens a newspaper and he's, he's pointing to all these clubs in the Catskills, the, the Neville, the Fallsview, the Concord. I mean, there were zillions of them up there and they all advertised at the time. He said, we want to put you to work in the Catskills. I'm going to start you off in New Jersey just to try your act out. And then I'm booking you into the living room, which was a really, really great nightclub on 2nd Avenue and 49th Street at the time. And I knew it because I went to it. Right. I would see Arthur Prysock there and, and Felicia Sanders. And you didn't even know, have to know who was playing that night. You just went, you knew you were gonna see somebody great. So anyway, he said, how many charts do you have, you know, for how, how big of an orchestra? And I knew what charts were. I knew I didn't have them, <laughs> but I knew that I could get them. So I said, well, how many do I need? And he said, well, we like for eight. And then he said, we can always build on that from there. You can always add more from there. You know, it might be a trio, it might be five, it might be seven, might be eight. So I said, okay, I left that meeting. 
I went home because we didn't have cell phones to call anybody immediately in those days. And I called Barry Manilow and I told him what happened. And I said, I need charts. And he said, no problem. All these songs we've been working on, we're gonna put them into an act for you. And we're gonna, I'm gonna make arrangements and uh, we're gonna get you an act. Wow. So uh, he called his friend Bill Inglis to help uh, with the, you know, doing the, some some of the arrangements and the copying and whatnot, so that I could have charts that I could get to work as soon as possible. Well, you know, uh, I imagine there are not too many people in the world who can say that their early arrangements and charts were made by Barry Manilow, <laughs> of all people. That's pretty astonishing. And it's, you know, well, I, you know, I look back at one of the songs that I used to do, The Days of the Waltz, which became later for me a parody and uh, like my French parody, but it, it had like three verses and each one went up a half a step, which is, you know, which, which he really did so much in his career with, mm-hmm. with so many of his songs. Oh, he was, hit, a lot of his songs, they, they, they modulate up that third and it always works brilliantly. So even though you were pushed down this road toward cabaret, what was stopping you from going down the Broadway route? What, what prevented you from doing that? Well, one, I didn't have the agent to to get to get me in those auditions and i really didn't like open calls i i went on a few but they were horrible i mean because you know it's what they referred to in those days as cattle calls Mm -hmm. but also the nightclub business kept me so busy that it was almost hard to you know to branch off you start obviously started to develop a reputation for being a cabaret performer so were you working the circuit well it was a different circuit then. It was, it wasn't, there wasn't such, we didn't think of anything as a cabaret. We thought of everything as a nightclub. Nightclub, sure. And and all the nightclubs that I played, I got paid. I mean, when cap, when the cabaret business came into the way we know it today, they started doing more of like working for the door and, uh, or, or a percentage of the door, even worse. But, you know, all these little cabarets had not started to open yet. Was the Holiday House, which was a Pittsburgh nightclub institution, was that around at that time? It was definitely around at that time. Did, did you work the and Holiday House? that was House? a big nightclub. That was a major nightclub. Sure it was. I never played the Holiday House, but I went to the Holiday House a lot and saw many, many acts. I'll tell you a, a quick sad story, very weird sidebar. Um, when I was about five years old, my parents took me and my brother to see the Three Stooges at the Holiday ah. House. And I got in line, uh, they put me in a suit and tie and the whole nine yards, and they got us in line, they bought an album that they had put out, the Three Stooges, and I got the autographs of all Three Stooges on this album. And my mother later threw it away. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> uh-uh, I'm not kidding. Oh you know, my God. To, and to her way of thinking it was a big waste of time, the Three Stooges, you know, so yeah. Oh, that's, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> it is a shame, but it's a true story. It was like I got to meet the Three Stooges when I was a little boy oh, it, at the Holiday House. Anybody would have wanted to meet the Three Stooges, of, little of or grown. Of course. All right, so how did your cabaret life, your nightclub life, how did that eventually lead you toward producing things, or did it not? Are they disconnected, or were they connected in some way? I think everything you know, in my life and probably most people's lives is connected and Mm -hmm. you don't realize it maybe at the time. But um, I mean, you know, so I started doing all these nightclubs and working in the mountains and um, going around the country opening for comics. I was not allowed to be funny. (laughs) Um, I was a what in those days they called a girl singer opening for a comedian. And there were very few women comedians in those days. Very, very few. Would you have done comedy if they had let you? Would you have had a comedy act? Well, I, I, I mean, there were times that I ended up saying something funny. I didn't think of myself as a comedian, right. but I get in trouble for saying something funny because somebody basically said something from the audience and I answered them and it was funny. I wasn't standing up there telling jokes. I just did a line that some, you know, that people laughed at that was a quick retort. And I got, I literally got in trouble for it. So I ended up getting married and divorced and there was in, in, in about like a four year time frame, I guess, at the time. And my husband at the time was very jealous and it was just easier to not work than 
to work and go through his jealous rages. Interesting. So when I got divorced, I just, you know, after a while, I was like, this is like ridiculous. I, I actually had run into Barry Manilow at, well, I didn't run into him. I went to, um, I, do, I guess I did run into him. I went down to buy my husband a present in a snowstorm. <laughs> and it was on East, in the East 20s where Barry was living at the time. And he was right next to an antique shop. And I knew that he was next to an antique shop because of all my rehearsals with him were next to the antique shop. So I went to get uh, my husband this present that I had my eye on for him. And the shop was closed because of the snowstorm. But Barry was getting ready to do Carnegie Hall with Bette Midler. And she gave him three or four songs in the middle of the show so she could change her clothes. Okay. And he said to me, if you want to come, it's sold out, but you just go backstage. My manager will walk you in. You may have to stand if you can't find a seat. If there's a seat, take it, but you may have to stand in the back of Carnegie Hall, but at least you get to see the show. And I'm doing three songs, one of which, by the way, was Could It Be Magic, which he had premiered for me. Yes. So no, I was like, of course I'd like to be there. <laughs> so I get, I'm so excited that I go home and the first thing I say is, oh my God, I ran into Barry Manilow and he invited me to his concert with Bette Midler and we can go, we, we might have to stand and, and any, all of us, it's just started the biggest fight. He accused me of having an affair with Barry. Oh. Um, I mean, it just was ridiculous, which was the beginning of, I have to get, you know, well, one of the many things that said to me, I have to get out of this marriage. But at the time I was like, well, you know what? If you don't wanna go, your partner's wife was on the subway when I came home and I told her and she wants to go. So you don't have to go with me, I'm taking her, fuck you. <laughs> and, and so anyway, I went, of course, it was just a magical, magical evening. I bet, I bet. Oh, oh my God. And to walk backstage at Carnegie Hall was even more exciting than if we had had tickets and walked in the front door. Th this was as Bette Midler was starting to explode, correct? Yeah. I mean, it was before 75. Bet was really taking off. I mean, what had happened was also was that when I played the living room, Barry Manilow had just played the living room. With, he, had a, he had an act at that time called Barry and Jeannie. And he had just played the living room. So he did, and he said, I need a rest. So I'm just gonna get, you know, put you with another piano player I'm going to do all the charts and everything but but you you know play the gig with this guy Joel Mopsonson who I who I played with and then you know he got busier and busier with Bet so Bet was like you know really on her way to superstardom and she was just great now I had gone to see Bet at a place called Hillies way before she ever got Carnegie Hall cuz my agent was asked to come and see her. And he just, he didn't know, he thought she was great, but didn't know what to do with her. I thought she was amazing, but I wasn't an agent or a manager. You know what I mean? Sure. So luckily she had a lot of very smart people and she was very smart around her, you know, guiding her. And, and, and I think they did a good job. I would say they did a fairly <laughs> good job. Yeah. All right. I want to turn our attention to producing, which is what your forte is, at least it has been for quite some time. Um, people generally, I think, don't think of producers as being creative types. They think of them as being more money and technical and so on. But being a producer is a very creative enterprise, is it not? Well, it, it is. But to, to be honest, most of the kind of stuff that I get involved with or I'm asked to be involved with that other people are handling more of the creative than I am because okay. I, I came on board I mean the first thing I did produce was the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged you know my producing partner Jeffrey Richards who I met when I moved into uh, my th this new apartment which is not so new anymore but he invited me to see this one night show at Alice Tully Hall Complete Works of William Shakespeare Bridge, 
from London and it was by the Reduced Shakespeare Company. So I went, I loved it. The next day I got a call, how'd you like it? I thought, you know, he just sent me because he knew I had a good sense of humor and I was a good laugher. And I said, I loved it. And he said, how'd you like to produce it? And I said, well, what does that take? Mm -hmm. And he said, you'd have to raise money. I said, Jeffrey, I've never raised money. Now he had never raised money either, by the way. He was a very well-known press agent. So he got his his friend, Richard Gross, and myself, and the, the three of us raised money for Shakespeare Bridge. And that was like my my very, very first outing. I probably had more creative input in that than anything. And I still didn't have that much creative input because it was done in London it, and, and, and it came over with the guys who did it in London. They replaced themselves and it kept running in London. But when you get involved in a Broadway production now uh, as a co-producer, you know, you can go to meetings and you can put your two cents in, whether it's they listen to you or not is a whole other story. But, you know, you learn a lot. So it's great for, for people that, you know, are looking to do other things on their own down the line. But I always say to people, if you were looking to get involved in producing on, on Broadway, you have to either start small and be the big wig so that you're the, the creative force on a right. smaller project because you're not, do not start on Broadway. That's right. suicide. Well, sure. So you start small in a big role on a small project, or you start in a small role in a big project and, and you take on being a co-producer and raising the money and sitting in on the meetings so that you listen and learn. To me, that's, that's the best way. But lately I haven't really wanted to take on that major, major role of being a lead producer. I, I do it in that sense of my own cabaret shows because they're all variety shows. And yes, I am the creative force on all my Jamie Dorian Friends variety shows right. and all my TV shows. But for the Broadway and off-Broadway projects, for the most part, I don't have that much say. I have recommended people to take over a role and they got the role. I can't put them in the role, but you know, I was responsible for helping somebody get a replacement role in uh, the play that goes wrong. Uh, so there, you know, there, there's little things you can do, but, but that's not the, the major creative. Those are the, the people that really get involved years and years before. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to have been in that role in a, in a show that my friends Barry Kleinbord and Joseph Thalken wrote called Was, and had it moved, it, it had it kept on the trajectory that it was, and the, cult, the show was called Was, but <laughs> it was really on a great trajectory. They did act one for Lincoln Center, and Danny Burstein was in it. And they loved it so much that they said, go back and finish it and we'll present both acts. And then I think when it came back the second time with both acts, I think it was Howard McGillen in that role of Frank L. Baum. And it was, it was really, it was based on a book that the stories took place a hundred years apart. Frank L. Baum writing about um, the Wizard of Oz, but 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 really about what happened to her years later, and she ends up in an institution, and then a hundred years down the line, where somebody is dying of AIDS and is sort of researching this whole story. It's a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful piece with some gorgeous songs. The song "Time" is from there, and a lot of people mm. have re recorded "Time." Yes. Um, Polly Bergen sang it in her nightclub act. Howard McGillen uh, recorded it. Rebecca Luca recorded it for me. Uh, Tom, I think Thomas Hampton recorded it. So many people have recorded this song. And um, it, it's, just, it's very special. But it's a somewhat of a dark musical. So it's a, it's a harder thing to get, get off the ground. Hard sell. But that was one that I was willing to you know, go on the line for. So, so I just want to be clear, you tend to get involved later in a show's progression, not in the early development stages. For, for now, yes. Gotcha. Um, and if somebody comes to me early on, I will try to help them to places where it 
they can help develop it sure. or a producer that can help develop it. Um, sometimes they just ask me for some ideas for casting, whatever. But I don't, I don't have the time at the moment and haven't, you know, to get totally Im immersed in all of that. I would have hated to have been a lead producer this season with all oh, that happened oh. with the pandemic. Oh, horrible. The one thing you must learn, you know, really realize about being a lead producer, you have a huge liability. There's so much responsibility that comes along with it. It, it was a devastating year. I mean, I, I was involved with a lot of projects that were either in previews or running and doing really well. This was probably, you know, if the pandemic had, hadn't happened, it was maybe one of my best years ever. And certainly for me, one of the most exciting. And then everything just came to a, a big halt. Crashing halt, that's, there's no question. Things do come your way one way or another, and either you're a conduit for people to move in other directions, or you help them as things have progressed to get it over the finish line. I'm just curious, what is it about stories that attract you? What are you attracted to in terms in of what are you thinking when something comes your way? Are you looking for, are you purely looking for um, how it will work out financially? Or are you considering the art part of it? Or what do you consider when you're looking at new work? What makes this show well, attractive to you? I would say both. But I remember when I was asked about getting involved with Thurgood, which had I didn't get to see in, at Westbrook Country Playhouse with James Earl Jones, but he left the project to do another project and they ended up with Lawrence Fishburne. Right. And I was told by the, the, the lead producer, of which there was only, you know, really this one person, that it was a project that you had to do out of love because we'd be very lucky if we could get 50% of our money back. So knowing that, I can't go to an investor and say, hey, you want to get involved in a Broadway project that if you're lucky, you'll get half your money back? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do that, but I can do it myself with my own money because I believe in it. Right. And I believed in Thurgood because it was, even, it was a one-person show. I mean, Lawrence Fishburne is amazing on his own and it's just an incredible actor. But it, it was a story that needed to be told about Thurgood Marshall, who became the first Black Supreme Court justice. Right. And I wanted to make sure that people got to see that. It also ended up getting taped and shown on HBO, which was even, you know, more exciting. We ended up getting 60% of our money back. So we, I did 10% better than I thought. But I couldn't ask, I just did not want to ask a, an investor. And you don't need to give me any actual numbers. I'm just curious, what would you say are the percentage of shows that get put up in not just yours, but all Broadway shows that actually make their money back. What What is the percentage of that? Well, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but unfortunately it's not a high percentage. No. That, but the, you know, there's an expression, you can't make a living, but you can make a killing. Yes, absolutely. On Broadway. You know, there, there, there are shows that just make so much money and run year after year after year after year. Not that I've been in so many of those, but there are, and everybody's always hoping for that. You know, it's it's a funny business. If you get your money back when when you've invested on Broadway, you feel like you're a winner. Then the minute you go into profit, it's like, oh my God, we're in profit. <laughs> but then there's those shows that are paying a fortune. Like if you were lucky enough to be an investor in Phantom of the Opera or mm -hmm. Mamma Mia or off-Broadway shows Stomp, uh, Blue Man Group, those kind of things. I mean, there's just a lot of really great shows out there that have Hamilton. made tons of money. Well, Hamilton being probably the, you know, the most recent of the, the blockbusters. Oh, Wicked, which didn't even get great reviews, but it's a huge moneymaker. Huge. Um, so we're always hoping for those kinds of successes. Sure. You know, there's certain things you can look at and you say, okay, well, this should, maybe it's not the most artistic show, but because it's, it has so much appeal to the general audience and to the tourist audience that it should make money. I had a couple of those going, you know, this year, which were like Tina Turner, the uh, Tina, the Tina Turner musical, and Ain't Too Proud, which was the story of the Temptations. I mean, these were real crowd pleasers. 
and company was in uh, previews, which didn't even get to open before the pandemic. And that's a crowd pleaser. Now there are other shows that are that I get involved with. I got involved with Slave Play and Hangman and The Inheritance, all great plays. Did any of them have a shot at all, making a ton of money? Maybe in, you know, if they could get licensed all over the country, sure. yes. Right. But right. on Broadway, Probably not. They're not really going to uh, be and, touring. And, and the shows. inheritance was, you know, a, it it was two parts, and it was uh, very long. Each part was very long, so that was a deterrent. And yet, it was the most moving play I, I I've probably ever seen, and particularly part really? one. Most plays do not wind up in a bus and truck situation. It's a secondary licensing situation that makes them money. Exactly. In the old days, stars would play on Broadway and then they would tour the play on the road, but they don't do that anymore. Right. It's all musicals that's on the road, right? Right. Yeah. Right. For the most part. I mean, Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike that won the uh, Tony Award uh, the year that, that it was on, uh, that had a, a zillion licenses from, you know, to just do it wherever. And, you know, a show which was not a, a a Broadway show, but it was an off-Broadway show, which I wasn't involved with, but I saw it early on and I saw it with Peter Riegert and with Bruce McGill. And we sat there and thinking, well, this would be a great thing to produce. But me, none of us were producers at the time, you know, because it was like four guys, didn't have to be a star. You just learned the songs and the harmony and anybody could do it. And luckily they got a great producer to, to do it and it got licensed everywhere and it was a huge money maker. All right, so what what then, and this is a kind of a, an open-ended and hard question to answer most for most people, what is it about material that makes something good? What makes a good story good for you? What do you see sometimes and you go, I have to get involved in this? How does that work? Well, everything is different because I can't, there's, no, there's no one show. I mean, Quorum Boy was quite serious. It had come from London. Um, I knew about it. They sang at the at the end of it. They had a thirty piece choir that sang the Alleluia chorus, and it was so moving. But it was a tough story. Um, the inheritance that, was an epic and and very very moving. So it it has to hit you in the gut, doesn't it? It's got to be a something that just really really speaks yeah. to you in some way. I mean, slave play was. I had already done one Jeremy O'Harris play uh, called Daddy with Alan Cumming. So he, I knew he was a real up and coming playwright and he's nominated this year for a, for a Tony award for his play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, listen, if he doesn't win this year, he, he, he's going to win. He, he has got quite a career ahead of him. He's a, he's a young mover and shaker. The day I met him at the meet and greet for Daddy, he he was larger than life, dressed in in a crazy Gucci outfit that had been given to him by Gucci. Oh. I mean, he I think he was one of these trendsetters before we even knew what you know what what any of these uh, in, influencers were. Mm -hmm. You know, influencers today probably mean as much as as a good review. Well, that's what that's our social media influences. Influencers are sort of powerhouses now. Right. What would you say is the most important thing that you do as a producer or important things? What is it that you have to focus on and concentrate on that's a huge part of what you do in terms of, is it, is it the raising of money? Is it holding hands? I mean, what are the most important things that you have to do? Well, the raising of the money is the first is the first thing that you have to do because you're not going to get your co-producer title unless you can come up with whatever it is that they've set out for you to fulfill. Sure. And, um, and every production is different. There's not, you can't just say, oh, it takes this much money because every, you know, a play will have one thing, a musical will have another thing. The next season, a play could have less, have more musical, less, more. I mean, some producers don't want any co-producers. There, you know, there's some producers that don't want to give out co-producer credits. The thing with co-producer credits is it's almost like a little pyramid scheme because those co-producers are getting all their friends to go see the productions because they're, you know, they have a vested interest in it and they they have a love of it. 
that nobody else can relay but them. And it really does help sales. But, you know, look, Hamilton had three main producers. They didn't have any co-producers. They didn't need that. Right. There's some plays that need it and some that, that don't. It's just something that I don't exactly know when it happened, but, you know, they kind of started bringing on larger investors, let's say, and giving them a co-producer title. I don't know if it started with Woman in White or way before that. I know in Say Goodnight, Gracie, there was an amount that uh, if you came up with that amount, you would get this co-producer title. That was the Frank Gorshin? Um... Frank Gorshin played uh, George Burns. Now, I went to see that very early on, and my friend Rupert Holmes, who usually writes musicals and writes great songs, yes. um, in addition to musicals, he wrote the play, and I said to him, God, I wish I could have... I could be a producer on this. He goes, I didn't ask you there for that reason. I never would do that to a friend. I just wanted you to see it. I said, you don't understand. I loved it. I wished I could be a producer. <laughs> so I ended up as an associate producer on that project, but I loved that play. Would, loved you, say, would you say that the, the multiple producers that have happened over time on Broadway, where there are many producers on shows, do you think that that's an influence of Hollywood or is it just purely a financial problem? I don't know if it came from Hollywood or it just was an easier or faster way to raise money because every year it costs more and more and more money to produce a play on Broadway or a musical. And so, listen, when you look back in 1954 when my father put up $1,000 for Pajama Game or the next year, another $1,000 for Damn Yankees, those, those productions, they weren't that big of a, of a deal to, to produce. Now everything's in the millions and, and, and those millions you know, go up every year. No investor in the early days ever got a title as a co-producer. They were referred to as angels. Angels, sure. And they were almost anonymous unless somebody decided that they were going to put a paragraph in a program and thanking their angels. But most angels didn't want their names out there because they didn't want everybody hitting on them. I will tell you this, once your name is above the title, or even below the title, you know, whether it's a co-producer or associate producer, your name's in a, in a playbill. You can bet that the next person to come along is going to be sending you an invitation to come to a reading or an opportunity to invest. <laughs> How many of those do you get a year? How many, many invitations? Many, 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 many. Many, many, many. How many plays and, and librettos do you read a year? I prefer to see a reading if I can. Mm -hmm. The one play that I couldn't see a reading of, and I had to read it, was uh, Stephen Avi uh, uh The Motherfucker with the Hat. Right. I read that and laughed out loud. <laughs> I mean, it, it was hysterical. But in many cases, when you read a play, it doesn't necessarily translate to when you're reading it until you can see it. I remember reading an A.R. Gurney play called Indian Blood, which I was asked to get involved with at primary stages. And I read it and I was like, I don't know what to make of it. And I asked my director friend, Barry Kleinbord, he was kind of familiar with it, I think, because a mutual friend of ours was in it. You know, he was sort of leaning me towards doing it. I spoke to Casey Childs who ran the theater and said, you know, what should I do because uh, you know, I'm not getting it when I read it. And he sort of encouraged me to do it. I, I've done a bunch of Gurney plays at, with primary stages and I've never been disappointed. Mm -hmm. So just because it was Pete Gurney, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway. It was Pete Gurney. It was primary stages. It had a really good cast. I went to the in, invited dress, which is the night before first preview, when they allow usually... It, especially in an off-Broadway situation, a handful of people into the house, not not like a Broadway invited dress where it's almost full. Um, anyway, I went and I, it was hysterical. And they didn't even use props. Everything was pantomime. Huh. It was totally hysterical. And I sat there and went, I made the right decision. Now I went to the invited dress of Quorum Boy which was a serious play, 
I sat there in tears. I brought a few friends with me to the dress rehearsal and I turned to them and I said, I think this possibly could be the most important piece of theater that I may ever be involved with. Wow. And it, it was so, it, it, it spoke to me so much and affected me so much. Then the reviews came out, you would have thought that we committed crimes against humanity. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 the inheritance you know in the in the most in the recent things of things that i think that were you know major uh important things to be presented were like quorum boy thurgood and the most recent one the inheritance i was sitting there at the end of act one unaware that men were walking down the aisle and onto the stage but something came over me and people that I had lost to AIDS came, you know, to, to, right in, I mean, I, I almost saw them. It was wow. so, I don't even know how to describe it. it. It was so like moving. And then I started realizing there were men, not, it wasn't a figment of my imagination, but my imagination was I put faces to those men and people like, Clovis Ruffin or Bob Harrington or the zillions of people that I lost over those years to, to this horrendous disease. And I was just crying uncontrollably. I was with a, a, a girlfriend. I had Kleenex in my purse. I knew if I was crying that any minute she'd be going. And I reached into my purse and handed her Kleenex because I knew she was going to need it. Mm -hmm. And that production wrapped up was supposed to wrap up on the Sunday after the pandemic started. It was, it was scheduled to close that day. And of course it closed the Thursday before. Right. Um, but I mean, every major, I mean, Hillary Clinton came, Pete Buttigieg judge came when he was running and uh, it was, it was such a moving, moving uh, production that I will never regret being involved with it because it was so great. Well, that's that's probably the single thing that makes it so very worthwhile for you to to do to do what you do as a producer, so that you can come out with works that do move people in that way. I exactly. Assume. I'm just curious about casting. Clearly, um, shows don't work without great casting, one way or another. How important is great casting versus star casting? Is it critical in some way? Wow. It's, it's almost like it brings a different kind of an audience sometimes because star casting is, you know, they're coming to see the star mm -hmm. and not necessarily the play. Right. But, but that can be a good thing too. When P. Diddy was, was in um, a play uh, on a, Broadway. A Raisin uh, in the Sun. Raisin in the Sun, which, you know, takes me back to my youth it brought a whole new audience into the theater. So that is a good thing. And so, so sometimes star casting, you know, what it, it, it brings in an audience. And then if they leave, it, it's sometimes harder to replace them because people are used to the star. Right, sure. Um, in the old days, Broadway made the stars. We didn't put stars in a role. Sure. You know, Janice Page wasn't a star when she went into Pajama Game. It made her a star. A Ethel Melba Merman. Moore wasn't a star in Pearly. It made right. her a star. Right. Well, Mary Martin, uh, Ethel Merman, those folks, they weren't stars before they were stars on Broadway. Right. I, mean, that, I asked my dad, why did you invite, invest in Pajama Game? Did you, did you read a script or hear the music? No, but the star for us was George Abbott, who was the director. Sure. He had a great reputation. Exactly. Well, that's, uh, you know, there's something to be said for great directors, too. Uh, it's pretty good to have great directors, you know. Uh, all, and the all great director did, you know, was responsible for bringing in all the right people, casting all the right people and, you know, and, and, and made it so special. Well, I've, I've long said that when a show works extremely well, it's hard to tell which individual element is the thing that makes it work. But when a show works poorly, you can sometimes point to exact things that don't work. You can exactly. say oh, the, the direction's terrible, the acting is terrible or something like that. But when a show really works, it's hard to see what makes it work because exactly. it's, just, it's just working. Um, well, I had a kind of day job once 
where I worked for a, a, a press agent and we worked for, well, I first worked for a producer and then the press agent, but I think we started with the producer and sending out a sign in Sidney Brustein's window, which was the follow up to A Raisin in the Sun, Lorraine H H Hansberry's second play. And that went on the road. We were sending it on the road. Um, and it wasn't, you know, really done um, on Broadway. Uh, I don't know if it was ever done on Broadway. I'm just trying to even remember. I don't know. Uh, but because they wrote, uh, you know, sort of a follow up, except it was a, 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 a new playwright and everything else. Um, I look at play, I, I don't, there's very few things that I've done in my, I think I've done over 60 Broadway shows that, that I'm not, not proud of as a play. Sure. But even if it was, maybe the play wasn't the greatest play, you know, a performance was great or the actor was terrific. Uh, and it was a special thing to just be able to somehow ride your coattails on a star's, you know, coattails, you know. I'm just curious if you have any sense uh, at all as to what's going to happen with the theater as we sort of come out of COVID. Is it going to explode at some point where just there's going to be a ton of theater and you just can't get to it all because there's too much at one time? What do you think is going to happen at the end of this, this real ugly period we've been in? Well, I wish I knew. And, 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 and when you ask people that, you know, I feel that like no more than me, they don't know either. The only thing that, you know, most of us can surmise or guess, you know, they've announced that theater can't open till June 1st. I, I'm probably a little more, a little bit more pessimistic than that, that it would probably be either late, late summer, or early fall. Right. And who knows if everything will open then, because some of the shows that are very, very dependent on out-of-towners, the tourists, maybe they'll come later. I don't know. I mean, I think that what might happen on Broadway is that not all shows are going to start at seven or eight o'clock. If you thought it was hard now to remember what your showtime was, because sometimes on a Tuesday and a Thursday, they would have been at seven mm -hmm. and some plays did 730. And most plays were like at eight. And you, you, you really had to, if you didn't have your ticket in hand, you had to make a phone call or look something up because you could miss at, you know, the first act or the first half hour. So now they may stagger the starting times. You know, on 45th Street, there's like three theaters right next to each other. So rather than have all three of those theaters have exactly the same start time, they may stagger them to be 7, 7.38. And you have to make sure that which one you're going to and what time. That's what I think. And I don't know. But I think because they're trying to lessen the crowds on the street and in front of the theater. Listen, who knows how long it's going to be that when you go to the theater that you might still have to wear a mask right. or that you have to have your temperature taken. And that's going to be a, a problem if you have a group of four or six and one of the people in the party suddenly has a temperature and they're not allowed in. Ugh. I mean, I don't know how you deal with that. Anybody that's ever been to a Broadway shows knows, knows that a pretty significant number of shows let out at the exact same time, right around 1035, 1040, somewhere in there. And the streets are packed after a, you know, on a Friday night or a Saturday night. So you're correct. They're going to have to figure out a way to reduce the flow of traffic on the street. Um, or they so run the gonna, risk of... You know, probably, you know, look at theaters of what time they should start. Probably, you know, maybe the shorter ones would start a little later so that it allows for the, the three-hour plays to start earlier and get, I don't know. Yeah. However they're gonna work it out, it's, it's gonna be something. Um, huh. I hope that we can get back to normal, obviously sooner rather than later. There, there is nothing like being in the room, nothing. Well, you're and, correct. There is nothing like being in the room. It's a, it is a unique and magical experience to go to a live show and there's no getting around it. Um, last couple questions for you, Jamie. Do you have um, any particular story or more than one, you can, one would be great, that you can think of in your whole career that was either weird, strange, quirky, offbeat, or just plain funny, some kind of a story like that you can share? Well, other than the ones I've already shared with you, yes. um, and this has nothing to do with producing or anything, but, had I ever had anything worthy of getting on The Tonight Show for, 
I was told that this was my Johnny Carson story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I was told that by the booker of the Johnny Carson show at the time. <laughs> Because I was living in New York and um, a friend of my parents was going to be in L.A. When I, when I was in L.A. But at that point, I, was in, I actually was in L.A. for one. I, I lived out there for like a year. So I, I was living there. She had called me and said, I'm coming to, to L.A. I, I'm staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Why don't we meet for a drink? So I, I'm like, great. And I'm, I go to the Beverly Hills Hotel to meet her. I get to the door, I'm looking around and I don't see her. But I, some people in the corner sort of waved me over. Uh, before I went over, I called her on the house phone and I said, some people invited me to join their table. So why don't I just wait for you down there if you're running late? I go to the table and I said, do you still want company? And they're like, uh, sure, join us. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm introduced to all these people that was kind of an ever moving group. But some of the people in the group that stayed were Marty Ehrlichman, who was Mar uh, Barbara Streisand's manager to this yeah. day. Yes, indeed. Um, and Hilly Elkins, who was a, a, a producer. And my friend came downstairs. Um, she was probably drinking on the plane on her way out to L.A. She's at the table, continuing to drink, getting a little drunk. And, and there were a couple of single guys at the table. She gets on the phone. She's calling all her single friends in LA to try to fix them up, which didn't really work. But she decides that she's going to call her friend and complain about the room she was given, that she wants a different room. And she leaves me there. I go to dinner with them. We went to dinner on Sunset and Doheny, whatever restaurant was there at the time, because it's been so many restaurants mm -hmm. that I can't remember. At dinner, there's a lot of whispering, and they said, come with us, we're going for a drink after. I have no idea where we're going. I figure we're going to a club or something. So we go to a home that had a guard with a gun and an iron gate and a lot of cars in the driveway, which was a big driveway. So it could have been, it could have been like a, a, some sort of weird private club in the hills of Beverly Hills. I, don't, I didn't know LA that well. They ring the bell and Sammy Davis Jr. answers the oh. bell. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. So at this point, he says, come on, come downstairs because I'm going to be on The Tonight Show. And this was when, you know, Johnny Carson was still The Tonight Show. Right. We go downstairs with his wife, Altavis, and we watch him on The Tonight Show. There weren't a lot of us at this point, but it was still Hilly Elkins and, and, and Marty Ehrlichman and a, and a few other people. And we watch him on The Tonight Show, we go upstairs after the show, and we drink at his bar. So now... We, I mean, I don't know what time we left there. It was, you know, relatively late. But my, my car was still at the Beverly Hills Hotel because I hadn't driven it to the restaurant. And from the <laughs> restaurant, we went straight to, that, to his house. So I had to go back to get my car. So this guy says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back. As I'm getting out of the car in the driveway at the Beverly Hills Hotel, I said to him, I cannot thank you enough for this evening. I started off with nothing to do, and I end up at Sammy Davis Jr.'s house. I am, it was the, one of the best nights of my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He goes, well, we loved you, Sammy loved you, but I gotta tell you, when we motioned like this, we weren't motioning to you, we were motioning to the maitre d'. Oh. I literally <laughs> fell out of the car, onto the driveway of the hotel. <laughs> I was like, holy moly. I, and I ended up still, I ended up at Sammy Davis Jr.'s and they're still saying, who is this girl and why is she at our table? <laughs> so you had a whole night. Once again, you were an accidental tourist in the whole thing. I totally was. <laughs> That's that was great. my tonight story, if I ever got a tonight <laughs> show story. <laughs> Last question. Oh, that was great. Last question, Jamie. Do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip 
that you can lend to those who are starting out and maybe trying to find their way into the industry, or maybe they're in a little bit and are hoping to get to that next level? Well, I think in every level of the industry, there's different things that you need to, to do. You know, if you're an actor, you got to act. And if you can't get in a Broadway show right away, you get into a something. You, 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 you get into a reading, you get into uh, an off-Broadway or even an off-off-Broadway or a touring something or community. You just have to do. And, and, and Hal Prince had said to me when I came to him for advice before I ever moved to New York, not that I took it, but he said, you know, be a big fish in a little pond, mm -hmm. make a reputation for yourself so that, you know, that you're already making waves so that people want to hire you. I just was living in Pittsburgh, in my parents' home, in college, I wanted to get out of the house. So I came to New York maybe a little bit too soon, who knows, but, um, you just have to do, I mean, you're, you, and, and I remember when I was asked to open for Joan Rivers, which was already, I'm in the nightclub business. Right. And the pay was very, very little. And I had to share it with my piano player. Um, but I said to, I had a friend that was at APA at the time, Marty Klein. And I told him I was offered this job at the LA improv opening for Joan Rivers. And, and when I got out to LA, there, the, the actors went on strike, so I couldn't get any auditions for what I intended to go out there for, which was to be a second banana on some TV show. It, it couldn't happen. It, there was a big strike, and then uh, the th you know, another strike and a threat of a third strike. So I got this, and he said to me, you know, you're never going to get discovered staying home. It doesn't matter about the money, because even if you got the whole paycheck, it still isn't a lot of money. So you take it, you do it, you're seen, and one thing leads to another, which of course it did. And it also led to me opening for Joan in New York too. And, uh, and many other things along the line that, you know, snowballed after that. Um, I mean, even, even my producing was probably helped along the way because I joined an organization called Manhattan Association of Cabarets and started doing things for them. And then, and I d gave birthday parties and had uh, some of my friends entertain and, and, w and that snowballed into, I decided to do Jamie Deroy and Friends as a show as opposed to just being me on stage for the whole hour that I was gonna bring friends to show their talents and share those friends with my, you know, with my friends and, and try to expand everybody's audience. So it's a whole snowball effect. And if you're, you know, wanting to produce or co-produce, you know, work with somebody who's already doing it at a higher level than you are. And if you have to just help somebody raise money or just work in somebody's office, there's more people that have started off as somebody's assistant that then went on to have very, very big careers, so. Absolutely. Well, I, I tell you what, that's huge amounts of just very valuable advice. Um, you just have to go do it. That's the first thing, that's really important. And then, and then on top of it, if you, don't, um, if you don't make those connections that then turn from one link into another link in this long chain of a career, it will break. You won't be able to proceed. So you're, I think that's just really terrifically valuable that it is one step leads to the other. And you've got to start somewhere. And very few right. people start at the top. So you've, you've got to just start and go. Well, I'll tell you a great story of, of I was doing a, a TV show, the, probably one of the one I'm most proudest of, called Backstage at the Sound of Music. My press agent, Peter Cromerty, at the time, was the press agent for this revival of Sound of Music with Rebecca Luker. And it was in what is now the Al Hirschfeld Theater, the Martin Beck Theater. He said, I can get you backstage if you like, if you'd like to do you know, some interviews. So I had a friend, Rick McKay, this was before he ended up doing um, Broadway, The Golden Age, which was really morphed from another project that I worked on with him that, that Broadway the Golden Age grew out of that. So anyway, I asked him as a favor, would he 
come and film this with me because it was a bigger approach than anything I'd done for my television shows. And we went and we talked to everybody from the crew to the cast, to the stage hands, to everybody. The, the child wrangler, the sound guy, a lot of these, this footage ended up in his movie. Um, <laughs> but one of the people that I was interviewing was Rebecca Luker, who was the star. She was uh, playing also with Michael Seabury, but she was the female star. And uh, she was having her, she was in her skull cap. They had just put her microphone on and I always wanted to show that because nobody understands how these microphones work. Right. Um, and, and in her case, it was this teeny little thing that was a, a, across the skull cap with a little thing at the top of her forehead. And then on top of that, the wig went on. So as she's telling me all this and we're filming this incredible thing with the microphone, I said to her, uh, what are you going to be doing next? And she said, just a little R&R. And, R. and I, I knew that she was going to be leaving because they were bringing Richard Chamberlain into the show. Mm -hmm. And most producers don't want to pay two big star salaries. So I'm sure that they didn't renew her contract just because they didn't want to, you know, pay another big salary that they could get someone for less. So I said, well, who is taking over for you? And she said, my understudy. And I said, wow, that doesn't happen too often. Who's your, you know, um, who's your understudy? And uh, she said, well, she's, you know, playing a party guest in one of the nuns. So we, I wished her all the best. I turned, we come out of there. I said to Rick, we're going to go find this understudy. And it was Laura Benanti. Wow. And she was that. So she was in the chorus. She left school to be in the chorus of this show and her, or her career from taking that leading role, replacing it just skyrocketed from there. That's, uh, and that is, that's truly Broadway or Hollywood, whatever you want to call it, show business. That's the way it sometimes really works, where somebody gets a huge break by being in the right place at the right time. Well, Shirley McLean, it happened to Shirley McLean, where sure. she was ready to hand in her notice, and uh, they, they, she was ready to hand it to him. They said, you're on. She didn't even have shoes. They had to spray paint her shoes. Carol Haney had, had hurt her ankle or something. It was like, so yeah, so it does happen. And then she went straight out to Hollywood right after that one performance. Well, uh, you know, what's that old saw that luck uh, favors the prepared mind? So that exactly. if, you're, if you're ready to go at that moment, that's really a, a big deal. So you have to always be ready to go. Uh, you know, just fantastic advice. Jamie, this has been a spectacular hour plus. I can't thank you enough for joining me on Storybeat today to share all this these great stories and all this marvelous wisdom. I am just been truly grateful to you for being with me today. Well, thank you. It's been fun to talk to you. I hope if, if and when I get back to Pittsburgh, I get to actually see you in person. <laughs> oh, I would love to, to absolutely meet you in person. That would be fantastic. Let's do that. Let's just set that up and make that happen. We'll try to go to the old haunts, most of which are gone. <laughs> yeah, I know. So you can ride by and wave. But <laughs> Do you know that I wanted to bring Klondikes to New York? <laughs> well, I actually brought a pack of crispy Klondikes and plain Klondikes in dry ice to New York, called up this guy who had brought Seduto ice cream to New York. He put it into the Bitter End uh, Cafe. <laughs> and I called, I called him up. I said, Billy, I was like having drugs in my, I got, I got the Klondikes. <laughs> and he came over and he tasted them. He said, this is amazing. And then I called Bill Isley the next day and said, I have a partner, we want to bring Klondikes to New York because they're my favorite snack. And he goes, well, you know, we've been thinking of doing this ourselves, so I, I, I can't let you have the, uh, the franchise. And I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> well, they eventually went worldwide. You can get now they have all kinds of flavors. There we had two. Yeah, you had the crispy and the plain. That was it. Exactly. Right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and chip chop ham. That was the other thing. Heisley's oh, chip the chop barbecue ham. ham. It was this, and I hate ham, but I liked that. <laughs> well, I have no, don't explain it because I can't. But I love chipped ham with the barbecue sauce. And if you try to serve me ham today, I'll, I I I can't eat it. <laughs> Jamie, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. 
If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.